Well, hello, biochemists. Welcome to the very first review video. Uh, thanks for bearing with us this first condensed and crunched week. Hopefully the material is largely review for most of you. That certainly seems what it sounds like from what I've heard in the Edpuzzle videos. So um, that makes this week a little bit more tackleable. But we'll have more time for each of these assignments in the upcoming weeks, especially when the material gets a little bit more challenging. But this is what's on slate from what I've heard from you. Again, because of our crunch schedule, I'm also recording this before I've heard from all of you, so my apologies, but so that we can get through this week on time, I do need to record this video before the deadline for the videos, the lecture videos. But so far, it looks like uh, many of you are interested in a short review on Van der Waals interactions from the first lecture, as well as the relationship between pH and pKa. So we'll certainly hit on those. And then for lecture two, I've heard from a good number of you already as well, which is awesome. And it seems from there, we want to talk a little bit more about resonance, that basic chemistry principle, and classifying the amino acids. Most importantly, what you'll be expected to know and what you won't be expected to know. So we'll take care of all of that in this video and hopefully keep it short and relatively sweet. So, van der Waals interactions. As I'm sure you know from your chemistry already, each atom has a nucleus. And in that nucleus, there are positively charged protons and sometimes neutrons. Sometimes not, but sometimes neutrons. And then orbiting around this nucleus are electrons of some kind or another. And hopefully in your chemistry experience, you've learned that it's actually not true orbits of electrons, but that the electrons move in all different pathways, and so they more create a spherical cloud around the nucleus rather than like these planets around the sun kind of analogy. But all the same, we've got negatively charged electrons orbiting a positively charged nucleus, which contains those protons. So here's one atom that fits that bill, and we can draw another atom of the same type, of the same element that fits that bill as well, and it will also have electrons orbiting it. Now, very, very far apart, these two atoms won't interact with each other at all. They won't have any impact on each other whatsoever. But as we bring these atoms closer and closer together, the negative charges of the actual electrons will exert a repulsive force on one another. Uh, like charges repel, we know that from everything we've learned um, all along our education, and so these two like charged, negatively charged electrons will repel one another. So if I draw this a little bit more simply, let's say it is a positive charge in the nucleus and a negatively charged cloud around each of those atoms, as we bring those two atoms closer together and that repulsive force pushes against these electron clouds, one of these electron clouds is going to be displaced relative to the other. In other words, one of these electron clouds is going to win the repulsion. So this electron cloud is pushing and successfully pushing back on this electron cloud. As we do that just a little bit more, what we start to notice is that the majority of the force or charge that we see on this half of this atom is positive. And the majority of the force or charge that we see on this side of this atom is negative. And this negative charge and this positive charge will favorably interact. And that's a van der Waals interaction. That's really it. It's this very, very subtle negative charge from the electron cloud predominantly being on the right side of this atom, and a very, very subtle positive charge from the nucleus predominantly being on the left of this atom that it interact with each other. And that's really it. Van der Waals interactions are also called induced dipole interactions. And I love that name because a dipole is something with an uneven charge. And induced means to force upon. So this atom is inducing a dipole in this atom. This atom being close enough to this one, its electron cloud is pushing away on this electron cloud and exposing the positive nucleus. That's the induced dipole. And once those dipoles are induced, then you can get your interaction. Now, if we keep pushing these atoms together, if we continue to push them closer and closer together, what's ultimately going to happen is that we'll get to a distance where both electron clouds are pushed apart 
both nuclei are exposed and now we get a clashing or a repulsion of the positively charged nuclei. So we will lose this attractive force if we move these atoms too close together. So if the atoms are too far apart, no interaction, just because these electrons are so far apart from one another that they're not pushing on each other, and no dipole can be induced. If we push beyond that magical point, we're going to get repulsion from the positively charged nuclei. But at that critical window of van der Waals distance, the electron cloud of one atom will push against the electron cloud of another. By pushing those electrons away, we expose that nucleus, and now we have a favorable positive-negative interaction that's your van der Waals. So on the foot of the gecko, we talked about these hairs. Well, the atoms of these hairs are inducing dipoles in the atoms of the wall. And so if we push the electron clouds away of the wall atoms, leaving a positive face on the wall, and that allows the electron clouds of the gecko's foot hairs to be more towards the wall, we're going to get that positive interaction, and we're going to get that van der Waals interaction, and that gecko can appear to adhere to the wall or ceiling. So that's van der Waals. Hopefully that's a little bit clearer than it was before, and if not, certainly you can follow up with me and let me know. So moving on to pH and pKa. So pH, what is a pH? Well, it's a measure of acidity, acid, acidicity, acidity, who knows? We'll say that's acidity. pH is a measure of acidity, but more so pH is a measure of the concentration of free protons. The higher the concentration of free protons, the higher the acidity. So things that are more acidic have more free protons in them. Things that are less acidic have less of a concentration of free protons. Now, if we take the log of that proton concentration, that gives us pH. But what logging a number does is it actually inverts its relative value. In other words, a low pH is acidic and a high pH is basic. So when a pH is low, you know that proton concentration is high. And when a pH is high, you know that proton concentration is low. So we want to keep these things in mind. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14. Again, low pH is acidic, high pH is basic, and right in the middle of that line, that's our neutral pH. That's when the concentration of protons equals the concentration of base or hydroxide ions. So that's our neutral pH. So that's pH in a nutshell. Lots of protons makes you acidic, few protons makes you basic, Lots of hydroxyl ions make you basic, few hydroxyl ions make you acidic, and as the pH goes down, proton concentration goes up, you're more acidic. As the pH goes up, proton concentration goes down, you're less acidic or more basic. So that's the basics of pH. Now, if we think then just kind of from a common sense perspective, if we have a strong acid, and we'll use that kind of chemist notation of an acid, HA, where A is for acid and H is the proton. A strong acid is going to be strong because it contributes a lot of free protons to the solution. In other words, it's a strong acid because it donates its protons readily, increasing the concentration of the protons in that solution. So strong acids readily donate their protons makes sense. If we go back to what we set up here, the more free protons there are, the more acidic you are. Well, the more the acid donates its protons, or to say it another way, the more willing the acid is to give up its protons, the more those free protons that were just given up will contribute to the acidity of the solution. Weak acids really don't increase all that much to the free proton concentration. That's why they're weak. What that means is that weak acids do not readily donate their protons. <coughs> Excuse me. A weak acid means when you put this thing into solution, the pH doesn't change so much. Free proton concentration doesn't go up so much. That's why it's a weak acid. Whoops. Sorry about that. 
And the reason why free proton concentration doesn't change so much in the presence of a weak acid is because the acid is staying in, in its associated form. It didn't donate its proton. Here what happened was the acid dissociated. Free proton was released and contributed to a decrease in pH. Here the acid is weak. The acid likes its proton. It doesn't want to give up its proton and so it stays in this associated form. The proton is not free and the pH doesn't change. So that's a weak acid. Now let's keep building on that. Let's go back to our strong acid. Our strong acid HA is strong because it readily dissociates into free proton and what's left. We'll talk about what's left in just a second. That's why it's strong because it readily dissociates, which means it's releasing free proton. Free proton concentration is going up. That makes us acidic. pH is going down in the presence of this acid. It's strong. So why did this, pro this acid readily dissociate? Well, to be a little bit anthropomorphic, it's because this acid hates this proton and readily gives it up. It's like me and lima beans. You want my lima beans? Here you go. I don't even want them. You can have them. That's what makes this a strong acid. There's not a strong affinity for the proton uh, to the acid, and so the acid willingly gives it up. Now, what this is called after dissociation this is actually a, a potential proton acceptor. So that means this thing is now a base and it gets a special name. It is the conjugate base. The conjugate base is the potential proton acceptor left over after an acid dissociates. So this is the conjugate base. Now what kind of conjugate base is this? Let's think about it in the analogy of the lima beans. I hate lima beans. Since I was a little kid, the only vegetable my mother would allow me to leave on my plate was lima beans, and that continues right now to this 43-year-old man that I am now. I will not eat lima beans. So if you give me lima beans, I'm a strong acid. I'll readily give them up. I don't even want them. Take them. You want these protons? Take them. I don't even want them. pH goes down. Free proton concentration goes up. We got a strong acid. Now imagine what's going to happen when you try to give me those lima beans back. Hey, dude, I didn't want them in the first place. Why in the world would I take them back? I don't like lima beans. When this proton is offered back to its conjugate base, this conjugate base does not want those protons. What made this a strong acid was that that proton was readily lost. It was readily lost due to a low affinity. That low affinity means it's very difficult to get this proton back onto this conjugate base. That makes this a weak conjugate base. Weak bases are bases that don't readily accept protons. And this base is going to accept this proton because it didn't want it in the first place. Now let's consider a weak acid. A weak acid does not readily dissociate, right? It really likes its proton. You actually have to work and force that proton off of that weak acid. There's a high affinity between the proton and the acid, that's why it's a weak acid. The acid does not want to dissociate. This is a conjugate base. When we can force that acid to dissociate, we have a conjugate base in the free proton. It's just that it's not readily occurring. That's why it's a weak acid. Again, there's a high affinity for the acid and its proton. That means the acid really likes its proton. I really like my phone. I do not want to part with my phone. I check my phone way too often. I have a high affinity for my phone. If you work hard to pull my phone away from me, and then you offer my phone back to me, I will take it rapidly and willingly. I will be a strong conjugate base. I didn't want to lose that proton in the first place. You had to work and force to get that proton off of me. And now that you've separated that proton from me, now that you've forced dissociation, you've made me a base, when you offer me that proton back that I never wanted to lose in the first place, you damn well better believe I'm going to take it back in a hurry. Any base that accepts a proton readily is a strong base. This is a strong conjugate base. So it makes logical sense. Now, we can take that way of thinking 
to go where we really need to go with this information, which is pKa. pKa is a property of an acid. It, it stays with the acid for the acid's life, and that's actually a bad way to say it. Uh, it's, it's a constant for the acid. This is a value that never changes. pHs can change in solution. If we add free proton, if we add hydroxyl, pH is going to change. The pKa of an acid or a base of a buffer does not change. It's a property of that molecule. What is the pKa by definition? Well, the chemical definition of a pKa that I like the most is that when... Right? This is a condition. This is if. If or when that acid is in a solution where the pH equals the pKa. Now, this is a property and it, un it is not changing. This is a condition and it can change experimentally. When we put that acid in a solution and the pH of that solution matches the pKa, then 50% of that acid will be dissociated and 50 percent will not so we have 50 percent dissociation and 50 percent no dissociation so let's give that a little bit of context let's say that we have a buffer molecule and it has a pKa of 5.7 that's a property of that buffer molecule 5.7 is never going to change but if we put that molecule in a solution, in a beaker, and the pH of that solution is 5.7, so now the pH of this solution matches the pKa of that buffer, we know by definition that 50% of that buffer molecule will be dissociated into conjugate base and free, a and free proton, and 50%, the other 50% of that buffer molecule, will not be. Uh, dissociated will still be in that acid form so that's what the pKa is now now who cares what's the value of that well, the value of that really goes back to what we were just talking about before let's imagine a number of different buffer molecules let's call them buffer 1 buffer 2 and buffer 3 and let's give those three different molecules three different pKa's let's say that this is 3.2 let's go back to our old friend from before 5.7 and let's say 8.4 well let's make that even a little bit more basic just to spread it out let's say 9.4 now one of these is a weak acid one is an intermediate acid and one of these is a strong acid and based on these pKa's we can figure out which one what we can first do to kind of do this mental experiment is ask ourselves when will there be 50% dissociation? In other words, when would we expect to see half of these buffer molecules, half of these acids, to dissociate? Well, that would be at a pH of 3.2, a pH of 5.7, a pH of 9.4. Because when the pH equals the pKa, we have 50% dissociation. Then you have to apply the same common sense approach that we were talking about a moment ago and ask yourself, well, which one of these seems like a strong acid? In other words, which one of these readily gives up its protons? Which one of these thinks of protons as lima beans and says, you want them? You can have them because that's a strong acid. Here, it looks like we need a lot of base around to reach 50% dissociation. A lot of base. We have to have a lot of negative things pulling on those protons, tearing at those protons. Hmm. So if we need a lot of base to get to 50% dissociation, it doesn't really sound like buffer 3 wants to lose its protons at all. Quite the opposite. It sounds to me like buffer 3 really likes its protons. And we have to have a lot of base around in order to forcibly pull those protons off of buffer 3. That sounds more like a phone to me than a lima bean. If we go up to 5.7, that's kind of close to neutral, kind of close to 7. So it buffer 2 likes its protons less than buffer 3, but still we have to have a fair amount of base around. But at pH 3.2, what do we have a lot of? Well, that's pretty acidic. 
So proton concentration in this solution is already high. There's a lot of proton in, in here. In fact, if you think almost in terms of the laws of diffusion, and things don't really want to go where there's already a lot of itself, there's already a lot of free proton in this solution. That's why we have an acidic pH. But despite there being all of these protons in this solution, still buffer 1 reaches 50% dissociation in this solution. In other words, buffer 1 is saying, hey, solution, I know you got a lot of protons there already. I know there's a lot of free protons floating around in you, but here's some more. Why? Because they're lima beans, because I hate them, I don't want them, and I'm going to give these protons up readily, even when there are already a lot of protons in this solution. Anything that gives up its protons readily is a strong acid. Now, once we give up those protons, what's left over, that A negative, that's our weak conjugate base, but this is a strong acid. Now we go back to buffer 3. Buffer 3 really had to have those protons ripped out of its dying claws, didn't it? Buffer 3, if you want to get to 50% dissociation, if you want just half of the buffer 3 molecules to give up their protons, you have to crank the base up quite high. You need a lot of negative bases around pulling on, ripping on those protons in order to liberate them from buffer 3. Buffer 3 does not want to let these protons go. That makes buffer 3 a weak acid. But because you had to work so hard to take those protons off of buffer 3, buffer 3 will readily accept those protons back when offered, making its conjugate base strong. So you kind of see the punchline. I could have just given this to you in a spoon-fed way, but that's not learning, right? That's just filling your heads with facts. So the shorthand of this is acids with high pKa's are weak acids, and acids with low pKa's are strong acids. If you look at a chart that has a whole bunch of different pKa's listed, the smallest pKa's on those charts are the things that will lose their protons most readily. Those are your strongest acids. And the highest pKa's on those charts really like their protons and need to have them forcibly removed. Those are your weakest acids. But understanding why that is is what's important to me, and, and hopefully this explanation makes that a little bit more clear. Now, one last thing on pHs and pKa's. When it comes to being experimental, like which buffer do you choose when you're in the lab, that choice is made solely on the pH you're shooting for. So if you're shooting for a pH of 7, let's say you're doing true biological research, you want a neutral pH because the pH in our cells is close to 7. If you're shooting for an experimental condition of a pH 7, then you want to use a buffer molecule that has a pKa that's near 7. What that means is that 50% of your solution will be conjugate base and provide you with buffering capacity for free protons that might enter, and 50% will be acid, providing you with some buffering capacity if base happens to be added. So we always want to shoot for a pKa of our buffer that's close to the pH of whatever it is we're shooting for. Tris happens to have a pKa of about 8, and we usually use uh, our solutions with Tris at a pH of 8, so Tris is a very common life sciences buffer. And you've probably used it for those of you that have done work in the lab. So yeah, that's the lecture one material. Hopefully you have a little bit more clarity around van der Waals, pH, and pKa. But again, always reach out to me if you want to review this again a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. So now, let's move on to resonance. Lecture two, what do we mean by resonance? First of all, what do we mean by it chemically? And maybe more importantly, what do we mean by it conceptually? What does it imply to us? So I've got a lot of drawing to do here to set this up. No need for you to watch me do that. I'm just going to pause this recording while I draw that, and I'll resume in just a split second for you once I've got everything on the board. So what I have here is typically referred to as a dipeptide. It's just two amino acids uh, linked together by a single peptide bond. We want to make sure that you're familiar with quickly recognizing all of the things that are involved in protein structure. And so let's take a quick tour here. First, we have the amino group of the first amino acid, and it is linked to the alpha carbon, the chiral carbon of each amino acid. These amino acids are um, not distinct. In other words, we're just using a generic form. So this R 
represents the side chain. This is what would differ. If this was glycine, this would be a single protein. If this was alanine, it would be a methyl group, etc., etc. That alpha carbon is linked to a carboxy group, which is represented here solely by the double bonded oxygen off this carbon. So we've got three bonds on each nitrogen, two hydrogens, and the bond to the alpha carbon. Uh, this carbon has um, one missing bond. We should actually have the proton in here. Sorry for that. And we should have a proton here as well. So four bonds on this carbon. This carbon also has four bonds, the double bonded on the oxygen. It's linked to the alpha carbon. And this, this is the peptide bond. This is what's linking this first amino acid to the next one. And then the cycle basically repeats. We have the amino group. Here it's only a single proton because we've got our three bonds around the nitrogen. Here is our alpha carbon of the second amino acid with our second side chain here. Notice that I did draw these in trans. This side chain is going up. This side chain is going down. That's common for all amino acids except for proline. And we have the fourth bond coming here to the, hydro to the um, carboxyl group. And that carboxyl group is complete. It's got the double bonded oxygen and the hydroxyl group here. So again, our dipeptide with a single peptide bond. But we're here to talk about resonance. So resonance, if you think of resonance, not even in chemical terms, but think of resonance as we typically mean it, it's when you kind of tap a tuning fork, bang, and it resonates. It vibrates, and you can hear it. It's almost like an oscillation of the tuning fork. That's resonance. And the reason why we use that word here is because really the idea is the same. Double bonds can sometimes, under unique conditions, resonate. They can vibrate. They can oscillate. And what they oscillate between is two adjacent bonds. So this double bond right here is the one that's going to resonate. And it's going to resonate by vibrating between these two positions. Let me pause the video once more and draw the alternate form of the resonating double bond. So here is the resonant form of that same dipeptide. A lot of things are the same. We'll see them as we go through. We still have this amino group here. Three bonds on the nitrogen, two protons, and the third bond leading to the alpha carbon of the first amino acid. Here's our side chain pointing up, and we have our proton. One, two, three, four bonds on the carbon. Here is our carbon of the carboxyl group. And it now has four bonds, one, two, three, four. But this oxygen that it is bound to is missing a bond. It has an unpaired set of electrons, a set of unpaired electrons. It's missing a covalent bond. Oxygen should always have two bonds associated with it. And this oxygen only has one. So it is now negatively charged. Notice that the peptide bond is now a double bond. That's the resonance. Remember, it's going to oscillate between these two positions, and that's our resonance. Now we come to the next amino group of the second amino acid. Nitrogen should always have three bonds, and this nitrogen has one, two, three. Ah, it has four. So since we have an additional proton above and beyond what we need to satisfy the valence shell of the nitrogen, that's inducing a positive charge there. The nitrogen is linked to the alpha carbon of the second amino acid. We have our proton and our side chain in the trans configuration. And then we are off to our complete carboxyl group at the end of the dipeptide. So resonance means that we are getting a very rapid oscillation fluctuation between the double bond being here with this carbon and its oxygen and the double bond being here in the peptide bond. That's what we mean by resonance. Now, typically, we won't do this commonly because it's just a pain in the rear to keep doing it again and again. We're going to be seasoned biochemists, so we don't really need to be worrying too much about um, what's going on with the resonance. We're going to know it's there. But typically, the way that we would draw resonance is this way. So you see, I've got one solid line representing a true covalent bond between this carbon and its oxygen and this carbon and its nitrogen. That's the... Um, single covalent bonds that we see here and then i've got these dotted dashed lines that represent a partial double bond this is the double bond that is oscillating that is resonating what that means for us in terms of relevance is that this pep peptide bond the peptide bond of all amino acid to amino acid linkages is partially double and double bonds cannot rotate. I will show that here. 
So if this is one group on one side of a single bond, and this is another group on another side of a single bond, I can freely rotate 180, 360 degrees around that bond. Truly, there's no interference. Now, if I do a double bond, I can't rotate. I'm not even playing around here. If I try to do the same exact thing here, I'm spinning, spinning, free, free, and I'm applying the same amount of force, and that's really all the rotation I have. So double bonds restrict rotation around the, the on the groups on either side of the double bond. And that's exactly what double bonds do in nature. This isn't a full double bond, but it's a partial double bond. So it does restrict the movement around that bond. What this means for all peptides, for all proteins, is that we have a static configuration of trans. In other words, because this group is going up and this group is going down, the partial bond characteristic, partial double bond characteristic of the peptide bond keeps these in trans and stops these amino acids from rotating relative to one another. So that's resonance. That's what resonance is chemically. Hopefully just a recap of things that you've covered in either uh, general chem or orgo. But more importantly, why it's so important and why we're coming back to it here is because it restricts the rotation of the peptide bond and keeps these side chains in a trans configuration. Now, the last thing, perfect, 30 minutes. So we are keeping this short. The last thing that's come up is just kind of a, uh, almost seems like a peace of mind question, for lack of a better term, of what it is that you do and do not need to know in terms of the classification of the amino acids. Now, amino acids are always classified chemically by their side chains, by the chemistry of their side chains, because every single amino acid has an amino group, has an alpha carbon with a proton, and has a carboxyl group, because every single amino acid shares all of these features, it really comes down to the side chain, the variable group, that makes an amino acid different from any other. So it's the chemistry of the side chain that we're focusing on. What that means is that when we're thinking about classifying an amino acid, let's just ignore the spine of the amino acid. I know there are charges there. The amino group tends to be positively charged. The carboxy group tends to be negatively charged. That makes it a zwitter ion. Forget about all that when it comes to classifying amino acids. When we want to classify amino acids, we're concerning ourselves only with the side chain. And we have three classifications, three primary classifications that we're most interested in. Polar with true charge. Polar, uncharged, and then nonpolar. Those are our three primary classifications of amino acids that are going to be most relevant to us. Now, the nonpolar amino acids are hydrophobic. This is going to have major implications next week when we talk about protein folding. These hate water. They don't engage well with water. They're actually repelled by water, and that's going to play a big role in how proteins fold into three-dimensional space. If you're polar, you're hydrophilic. So both of these amino acids actually engage quite well with water. They're hydrophilic. They can be exposed to water. They speak water's language of charge. The difference between them, of course, is the degree of the charge that makes them polar. Polar uncharged amino acids are just that. They don't carry full charges. The side chain has no positive or negative ionic charges, but there is a polarity to them. So what we're looking for here is electronegativity. We're looking for what we started this week with. What's making these side chains polar but uncharged is that there are electronegative oxygens or electronegative nitrogens pulling unevenly on the electrons that they're engaged with, conferring partial negative charges on them and partial positive charges on the proteins they're associated, protons they're associated with. So when we are looking to see is something polar uncharged, we're looking to make sure there's no ionic properties to that side chain, no full charges, and there needs to be something electronegative in that side chain conferring the uh, polar bonds that we need. Polar charge is just the opposite. Now we're looking for true ionic charges. We're looking for positive and negatively charged groups. And these are typically going to be acids or bases. So the polar charged side chains do fall into those two categories. We have acidic and basic side chains within the polar charged groups. 
Now, basic side chains are bases because they have already accepted their proton. Let me say that again. The basic side chains tend to be positively charged. They have acted like the base already. They've accepted the positively charged protein, proton. They are now positively charged. The acidic side chains have typically already lost their proton. So they are now negatively charged. So it's important to keep in mind that the proton loss or acceptance has already occurred, giving these side chains almost a counterintuitive, um, a counterintuitive charge. Now, that's what we want you to know. So I already told you that I don't expect you to memorize the amino acids. That's not something that I ever do when I teach this class. The reason's pretty simple, because when you do leave this class, but you need to know the basics of biochemistry, when the time comes that you need to know the structure of tryptophan, you're going to pull out your phone, that phone that is not a lima bean, that phone that you so desperately want to hold on to, and you're going to look up tryptophan, and you'll see the side chain. So we can always look these facts up when we need to. No point in me forcing you to memorize it now. However, what you will be able to do, what you do need to be able to do, is recognize right away what that tryptophan side chain is in terms of its categorization. In other words, what can it chemically and not chemically do? So let's kind of, on the fly here, just talk about trypto, tryptophane. I didn't prepare any of this, as you can see, but we can look here, and there's tryptophan, there's the side chain, so here's our amino group, here's our carboxy group, uh, and here is the side chain, pretty wicked side chain off tryptophan. And what we see is fairly unique. We've got this ring structure. Rings tend to be hydrophobic, but we've got this really strong nitrogen in there. So tryptophan is going to be uncharged but polar. It's a little bit ambiguous because we have the the, the uh, aromatic ring in there, but because that nitrogen is part of the ring itself, it makes the ring uh, polar, and we know nitrogen is electronegative, that's going to be a polar, uncharged amino acid. Well, what about aspartate? Aspartate. What we see come up is aspartic acid. So if we stop, and we go back to our bar to aspartic acid. Hmm, it should be negatively charged, right? It's already donated its proton, it's aspartic acid. It should be a negatively charged amino acid. It should be not only polar, but charged. So let's see. Aspartic acid, well, there it is. We see right here, there's that negative charge. It's lost its proton off this side chain. So indeed, we are polar and charged. Uh, let's think of another one. Let's do leucine. Leucine. So leucine, here is your carboxy group. Here is your amino group. Alpha carbon is uh, right here. Leucine is nothing but methyl groups, just hydrocarbons. There's no electronegativity here. There's no oxygens. There's no nitrogens. It's just methyl groups. That's going to be a unpolar, nonpolar, hydrophobic side chain. So what we want to do is keep in mind these three categories and the chemistry of these three categories. Polar charged are going to be acids or bases. They will have lost or gained protons. They will have charge in their side chain. Polar uncharged will have electronegative atoms in them, oxygen or nitrogen, pulling on those shared electrons, giving partial charges, which makes them polar, but not full charges, so they remain uncharged. And our nonpolar amino acids are going to have no polarity at all. They're going to be completely hydrophobic. They're going to have no electronegative atoms. They're going to have no charges. Largely, they'll be nothing but hydrocarbons, and they will not have any charge whatsoever. The reason why we set the stage of this week the way we did, actually the reason why the whole course is laid out the way that it is, is because we build on these concepts. What we learned about in that very first chunk of lecture one is already rearing its head here at the end of week one, and we'll continue to build on these principles as we move forward. So hopefully this video clarifies uh, some of this material for you. If other things were critically unclear to you and I didn't cover them in this video, or if things that I did cover in this video remain unclear, please, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. 
and let me know right away. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll be working with you all again real soon.